Saudage. It is a word that only exists in the Portuguese language. It is a longing for something once had and may never be attained again. I have lived with Saudage my entire life, a longing for a place, a feeling that I could not explain until now. I was born on April 1st, 1974, on the island of St. Michael, located 930 miles off the coast of Europe, which is part of an archipelago of nine islands. I immigrated to the United States in 1977, and for most of my life, I heard stories about the wonder and beauty of the Azores. I could never understand why my parents would leave such a place to come to the United States and toil in manual labor jobs. 33 years later, I decided to hear the stories of many immigrants and better understand their plight, which I found was an amazing story of strength and resilience. When you look at the Azores today, you see a modern European country with all of the technological advancements of the Western world, mixed with a unique and natural beauty. This was not the Azores that lost thousands to immigration from the 1950s to the 1980s. What was that Azores like? Some of the immigrants look back at what life was like in the Azores pre-revolution. Em São Miguel a vida era muito, muito pobre, não, não existia as, as facilidades que existem hoje, as pessoas eram criadas uh, muito unidas, muito amigas, mas muito pobres, uh, havia um par de sapatos uh, para o ano inteiro. We had no running water, we had no electricity, we knew all the neighbors, um, we knew the same families, and so as a little girl I was very inquisitive. And I was allowed to go everywhere and talk to everybody, and we didn't lock the doors. People were poor, they lived off the land, and, um, but in a sense, everybody was poor, so I never felt that I was poor or deprived of anything. But back in 1963, uh, life was a bit difficult, and uh, there were not many jobs and a lot of people. When you, when you lost one job, it was difficult to find another one, unless you had friends or relatives that would get it for you. So when you are 23 and with an uh, uh, uncertain future, uh, you start thinking, what I'm going to do, you know? When I was born, we were a family of brothers. It was very difficult. My father worked for his own purpose. He was a farmer. He had farms. He bought farms. He had 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 farms. E ele transportava, ele é que fornecia as lenhas para as estufas, para os ananases. Era tudo com lenha, uh, incenso, incenso. Uh, de maneira que a gente trabalhava, a mulher era com o meu pai e a minha mãe. Uh, a minha mãe não, a minha mãe nunca ia para as terras, era nós íamos ajudar. Os meus irmãos a tirar as batatas, o feijão, apanhou o milho e nós ajudávamos a juntar, a juntar da terra, pôr em cestos para eles transportarem para as carroças para vir para casa. A vinha a mesma coisa, tínhamos uvas, uh, nós é que fazíamos as uvas e meu pai o fim era meu pai e meus irmãos, o lagar. É muito humble. You know, that, that, that people who live off the land in some regard, I mean, their daily thing. My cousin used to say about her parents and other relatives, they don't change over there. And I don't know if that's 100% true, but I, I find it interesting that, you know, they, they, they live off the land, that's what they do. Um, that's just the way of life, that's what they were given. I lived with a child at dos anos, até antes dos 50, não é? Como qualquer, qualquer outra criança, brinquei, fui para a escola, chorei, ri, aprendi a nadar. A minha casa, a casa onde eu nasci, ficava mesmo, mesmo em cima da rocha.
quase que nasci, não foi quase que nasci, nasci uh, a ver o mar. Pelo menos minha mãe viu, primeiro do que eu, e muitas vezes. Então ima vamos imaginar que acordamos de manhã e trabalhamos todo o dia até o sol se pôr. E que no fim desse dia chegamos a casa, sentamos todos à mesa e temos que dividir um prato que não daria sequer para uma pessoa e então temos que fazer com que aquele prato dê para a família toda. E a família então, pode ser três, como pode ser sete, como pode ser oito. Então vocês que imaginam dia após dia, as pessoas, nós agora vivemos, mas na altura eles sobreviviam, eles trabalhavam tal como agora, só que a grande diferença é que nós agora trabalhamos, ganhamos e temos poder para comprar, para nos divertirmos. No tempo dos pais que emigraram, no tempo da nossa imigração, é imaginar uma vida de pobreza, mas essencialmente o que é que essa gente queria? E o que é que os pais do, do, dos filhos que nasceram lá hoje e os netos que estão lá hoje, o que é que queriam? Era, era exatamente isso, era que os filhos e a sua mulher não tivessem que passar pela tristeza que passaram não tivessem que estar na, na rua à espera que passasse alguém para poder ir trabalhar, não tivessem que estar à espera de, de chegar à noite com medo de chegar à mesa porque sabiam que não tinham nada para dar aos filhos. E o que é que essa gente fez? Essa gente pegou em tudo o que tinha, que era muito pouco, geralmente o imigrante levava uma mala, só para a gente ver a vida deles, a vida dos vossos pais cabia numa mala, era quase nada, e partiram com o um único sentido, dar uma vida diferente à sua família. A família acaba por nascer lá e, felizmente, o desejo deles e a luta de que eles fizeram, quer os que foram de barco, quer os que depois foram de avião e que depois até levaram muitos anos a pagar aquela passagem, foi exatamente para podermos hoje termos um carro, irmos ao cinema, comermos quanto quisermos, que hoje não damos valor porque não necessitamos, mas que no tempo em que os vossos pais emigraram era algo uh, que se procurava e não se tinha. Por isso, muito resumidamente, é imaginar uma vida de muito pouca comida, de quase nenhum dinheiro, e uma vida em que se quer e deseja-se melhor para os filhos. E a imigração, essencialmente, é isso. E o objetivo e o desejo, felizmente, foi concretizado na grande maioria de, dos casos. Our culture, our history is very poor. Very la uh, lack of material. But what it was never lacking was this richness in spirit. This richness in belief. Look, we are the people who went out on the waters and without a map, and sailed off into the unknown. Maybe they were afraid, I can't imagine they weren't. But you know what, they did it. And there's this, that sense of, you know, you can't lose that fearlessness that is in the culture. Poverty was a real issue for them. Yeah. And they were, they were forced to leave in massive numbers. And yeah. half the population of the Azores is in São Miguel. Yeah. So São Miguel was most profoundly hit with a migration phenomena. One of the major catalysts in the immigration of Azorians was the authoritarian regime known as Estado Novo, the New State, which ruled from 1926 to 1974. For close to 50 years, the Estado Novo was headed by the president of the Council of Ministers, Antonio de Oliveira Salazar. After the 28th of May 1926 coup d'etat, Portugal implemented an authoritarian regime of social, Catholic, and integralist inspiration. In 1933, the regime was recast and renamed Estado Novo, New State, and Oliveira Salazar was named as president of the Councils of Ministers until 1968, when he suffered a stroke following a domestic accident. He was replaced in September by Marcelo Caetano, who served as president of the Council of Ministers until he was deposed on the 25th of April, 
1974. The Carnation Revolution, also referred to as Vincent de Bril, was a left-leaning military coup started on the 25th of April 1974 in Lisbon, Portugal, that effectively changed the Portuguese regime from an authoritarian dictatorship to a democracy. After two years of a transitional period known as PREC, Processo Revolucionar em Curso, or ongoing revolutionary process, categorized by social turmoil and power disputes between left and right-wing political forces. 25 de Abril vem-nos abrir uh, outras portas, outros horizontes que nós não tínhamos. Antigamente, uh, a gente não sabia uh, como é que é, como é que o mundo andava, porque o Salazar não, não punha cá para fora o que se passava. Depois de 25 de Abril, Uh, do general Ramalianes e o Dr. Mar Soares serem primeiro-ministro e o Ramalianes ser uh, presidente, houve uma grande evolução. Mas depois isto parou e está um bocadinho a piorar. Está outra vez a voltar aos tempos antigos. Being in a dictatorship was not my cup of tea. I mean, I believe. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, it was very difficult. I was organizing strikes at high school level, you know, in classrooms, because um, that didn't go well. I mean, the, the, the teachers, uh, the way that the teachers, um, I'm talking about at high school level, the way that the teachers treated the students, okay, with name calling that was not appealing to say on television, uh, with, with, with an attitude of such superiority, uh, uh, that again didn't go well, okay, with, with, with my way of thinking. A and so all of those components, okay, uh, that were just, okay, the, the perfect way of coming to the USA. When I arrived in Boston, there was this gentleman, the, um, Mr. Albert Freitas, from the Portuguese Alliance, that you went to pick me up. And the first thing he handed me was a copy of the United States Constitution in Portuguese. And I read it coming from a, uh, a dictatorship at the time. Portugal was a dictatorship uh, for 48 years. I had already been called to the secret police when I was in high school. And uh, because of some political uh, activities that took place in the school, and that was quite an experience. Eu penso que nós continuamos num caminho que nunca mais irá regressar, nunca mais irá voltar atrás, portanto, ao ponto de, do início, ao ponto inicial. E, portanto, para mim, de facto, foi uma, uma, grande, uma, grande, uma grande diferença e hoje a gente vê que há uma grande diferença, portanto, nas mentalidades, no pensar de, dos nossos jovens, no pensar das pessoas que tinham a minha idade na altura. E, portanto, não há eh, hipótese de compararmos eh, a sociedade, o país eh, do século XXI, de 2010, não é? com o um país de 1974. Não há hipótese nenhuma de comparação. Para, enfim, acredito que haja pessoas, inclusive, que continuam eh, a pensar nas a regressar às cebolas do Egito, como a gente costuma dizer, mas uh, eu penso que uh, Portugal deu, deu um salto uh, enorme, uh, que não foi mortal, uh, foi um salto para, uh, de facto, para se colocar uh, ao nível uh, de, enfim, dos, dos, uh, dos países uh, que vivem uma democracia uh, em toda a Europa e em todo o mundo. You always have to question in the back of your mind, did our parents make the right choice? Wouldn't it have been easier for them? And wouldn't it have been you know, easier for us if they had stayed? And the answer is no, because at the time that they left was prior to the revolution. It was, you know, we had a, a, a the economics and the social fabric of the islands were still controlled by the dictates of the dictatorship. The opportunities or lack thereof were controlled by that stifling administration and government and so they had no idea when they left that if they had stayed another 10 12 years things would have gotten better and they would have lived this plush life and there is no question the work ethic of the immigrants is stronger than the work ethic of those who stayed behind they take two-hour lunches they 
they have a, a much more relaxed society than the hustle and bustle that we have here. But, as is there and there's always a but, I think that most of our generation wouldn't change our parents' decision, even though we know that it made our parents' lives harder. I think that's one of the fascinating things about what's happening, because you know those who stayed behind benefited from the fact that there was less competition for everything, and they did well, and the islands were able to rebound, and you could say that the islands wouldn't be where they are now if everybody had stayed behind. For many Azorians living under the Estado Novo regime, the thought of immigrating to another country seemed very attractive. Adding to this attraction was the perceptions they had of other countries, most notably the United States. My ideas about America are, a country of new adventures, many adventures, things that only enter in the head of new people. America, oh, é... É, é uma, uma coisa que, que não, não, não tem explicação. É, a gente, só o, nome, só o nome da América, a gente queria vir, queria vir experimentar, melhorar. Todos querem melhorar na vida, não, todos procuram ser melhor. Quando eu estava, quando era mais nova, eu via falar na América e a gente pensava que era uma, uma coisa como um sonho como um conto de fadas, que era tudo muito uh, fácil. A gente pensava que era a ideia que a gente fazia, mas uh, as dificuldades em todo, em todo lado. O que os Estados Unidos, o que a América representa? Este magic, este país de oportunidade, este país que vai te dar as possibilidades para ser o que você quer ser. Então, isso foi muito very much into my mind, at least. My father came to the United States twice, illegally, as you can imagine. He was caught, he went back home, they sent, they deported him. And uh, then he was always telling me stories about the United States, about America, how beautiful it was, what we could do, our dreams, we could fulfill our dreams, our fantasies, and everything else. And that worked in my mind for a long, long time. As I grew up, and my dream was coming to the United States. The American dream was not, for, for some of these people, was not about wealth, wasn't about fame. It was about having a better life for their children and their families and having an opportunity for an education. By coming to America, I had an opportunity to get my bachelor's degree, my master's, which I probably wouldn't have had an opportunity to do it there. I think that everyone thought that America was a thing Nunca vista que chegávamos aqui e que o dinheiro ia aparecer e as coisas eram tudo fácil e que ninguém tinha que fazer sacrifícios, mas não é nada disso, a vida era muito, muito, muito difícil. Quando, quando um homem e uma mulher emigram, emigram por necessidade e estão dispostos, porque essa gente quando emigrava não sabia a língua, não sabiam muitas vezes onde é que iam dormir na primeira noite, não sabiam onde é que iam trabalhar naquela semana. Logo, são gente que se dispõe a ir para a frente. Como há um, um grande amigo, de, de, que é o Adelino Cabral, um grande amigo da imigração australiana nos Estados Unidos, sempre para a frente. E era o lema deles, se é para trabalhar 10, 12, 14 horas, eu vim para aqui, que é para a minha família, não passar o que eu passei. E depois os portugueses e os açorianos têm uma coisa muito forte, que é o sentido de ajuda uns aos outros, porque os primeiros que foram e os seguintes foram, tentaram sempre ficar juntos e a comunidade cresceu e crescia sempre uh, uh, em volta na ajuda entre si. Por exemplo, em New Bedford, os quinta, por exemplo, as primeiras empresas de, de nível de pescado era secar, por exemplo, o bacalhau naqueles, naquele quintal que teria uh, melhores uh, condições. E uh, não faz mal se era o meu, era o do vizinho, era aquele que podia e que aquela interajuda. Só para dar um exemplo, por exemplo, em 1867, o governo do Havaí paga e aprova uma verba para que venham trabalhar, ou seja, ele paga as passagens, o transporte, dá-lhes casa e trabalho, que venham 200 portugueses, mas não são todos os portugueses. Ele quer que venham 200 açorianos e madeirenses para trabalhar a terra deles. 
Por isso, acho que isso diz um bocado de, 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 disso que, que queremos dizer, que é, foi gente que, pior do que viviam cá, era impossível. Por isso é que se sujeitavam a dar a salto para o escuro, que era muitas vezes a imigração. E ao chegar lá, deram tudo por tudo, e ainda hoje em dia dão, para que realmente aquela coisa que tinha na cabeça, a minha família vai viver melhor do que eu, whatever we need to do, é isso que eu vou fazer. My family and I uh, emigrated to the United States and arrived in New York on July 7, 1957. As you may well know, immigration laws back then were totally different than they were today. And the result that we came over was that my mother was born in Rio de Janeiro. My uh, grandfather on my mother's side was a judge. And just past the, uh, the time frame where Brazil was still a colony of, uh, of Portugal, he was uh, sent there for 14 years. My mother was born, returned to the Azores at eight years of age. As being a naturalized citizen of the Americas, it automatically gave us the right to come over at that particular time. It was strange. You know, you pick up, leave your friends, your relatives, your family, all worldly possessions, and, and travel across a, a large ocean and settle here in the United States. Fortunately, we uh, came to New Bedford, which was a, a large Portuguese population. We had friends and uh, You know, just friends, we didn't have any family here. And we started working. Uh, my father was a uh, university teacher in Portugal and here he became a, a chef at Anthony's Pier 4 in Boston. My mom, who had never worked in her life, was uh, became a, an assembly worker at Cornell du Belier and also at Cameo Curtains. People often ask me, Fernando, was it a, sh a cultural shock when you came to the United States back in 1957? I said, no. We came to New Bedford, you know, we acclimated, you know what, a lot of Portuguese. It was a different Portuguese population back then. The world was different back then. We're going back 50-some years ago. I came to the U.S., and I will never forget that day. It was a Friday night, August the 27, 1963. It was a unique experience in my life. I was just going to be uh, 16. And for a 16-year-old kid who never left the islands, it was my first trip all by myself. <laughs> it was quite an experience and quite an impact in my life. No question about it. On June 24th, 1964, I left San Miguel in, uh, in a boat, uh, Ponta del Garda, which I have some pictures. And um, myself and some friends of us, we left Ponta del Garda, we went to Santa Maria, where we stayed in a hotel over there, waiting for the Canadian Pacific Airlines that made the trip from Lisbon to Canada. And I arrived in Toronto uh, in St. Uh, John's Day, which was June 24, 1964. Uh, next day, I went to the Canadian immigration in Toronto, And right away, they sent me to a factory, Artistic Woodwork Company. is a company that manufactures uh, picture frames. And uh, I started working over there. And uh, I worked there for 46 years. I came to the United States in 1967. And uh, like everybody else, I have a little story to tell how it works. But it was not easy because I'm talking about the time when Salazar was in power. We couldn't even get a passport. Finally, three years later, I could get a passport and uh, I went to Belgium, where my brother was living, and my dream was coming to the United States. So I tried to work for the Swedish Merchant Marines and Norwegian for three years. I was traveling and uh, I couldn't take the sea. I was always seasick. But my dream was still come to America, which was almost impossible. So uh, we went around different countries and finally we stopped in Hawaii. We went to South America, Colombia and Panama Canal. And somebody says, Arnold, uh, we're going to buy uh, the United States to get some cars for Scandinavian, for Sweden. I said, beautiful, this is my, my time. This is my time to, uh, to run away. And uh, as we stopped in uh, North Carolina, 
After three years traveling, I jumped ship on Wilmington. And from there, I took a bus from Greyhound bus to New York, where I had one cousin, second cousin, and I went to visit him. It took me 20 hours from North Carolina to New York City. As you can imagine, the bus stops in each and every small village. So I stay over and uh, start working. I stay, I get married. I had to get married because I was legal. I was so nervous all the time, every time I used to go to like a restaurant. And when I saw a policeman or two patrolmen, my heart was boom, boom, boom. I thought they were looking for me. They're not even looking at me. They're doing their job. So uh, after I got married, I stayed five years in New York City. Then I, uh, I found that I had a friend in New Bedford. I came to New Bedford and I bought a small company. I came to the United States of America back in 1972. By then, I got myself a job, worked for Anderson Little Company, former company actually. It's, and then I worked there until November 1992. Then we shut down the business. And by then, going back, when I started to work there, it was, it was hard for me at first, but then I kind of grew up with the company. They promoted me, you know, uh, from a section supervisor to a, a quality control manager, you know, in a factory. Uh, at the time when I left there, that was my position. I immigrated to the United States in 1967. No final de 1967, vim como visitante porque os meus pais tinham vindo, uh, não porque realmente houvesse uma grande necessidade, mas havia a guerra em Angola e o meu irmão estava a atingir uma idade que depois não poderia deixar o país, a minha mãe era americana e, portanto, resolveram, digamos, no espaço de dois ou três meses, vir para os Estados Unidos. E uh, eu fiquei, portanto, eu trabalhava para a Segurança Social e fiquei E em 67 resolvi vir fazer uma visita aos meus pais. Eu desde miúda tinha sempre uma admiração muito especial pelos Estados Unidos, dado o meu avô ter vivido muito tempo aqui nos Estados Unidos. E de forma que vim, fiquei adorando o país e decidi ficar, porque já trazia muita documentação preparada no caso de querer ficar. Nunca me arrependi. Ainda hoje adoro o meu país, vou lá com bastante frequência. Uh, sou a natural do Faial, portanto, e visito o Faial com muita regularidade, tenho lá propriedades, mas é sempre de visita. Estados Unidos foi o meu país de adoção e é o país que eu, por enquanto, gosto de viver. Eu concluí o liceu aqui em Ponta Delgada em 1978. Nessa altura, uh, ainda era mais acessível para os um, jovens açorianos uh, a frequentar o ensino superior nos Estados Unidos do que nas próprias universidades do continente. Curiosamente, isto por força do elevado do, do, das comunidades uh, radicadas nos Estados Unidos e no Canadá. No ano, em, em 78, Ainda fomos um contingente de cerca de meia dúzia de, de rapazes que, em setembro, apanharam a sata e embarcaram nesta, e embarcaram nesta aventura. Ao chegar aos Estados Unidos, comecei por frequentar o BCC, em, em Fall River, ficando, estando a residir em New Bedford, onde, com, em casa de uma irmã. Passei, frequentei o BCC, de onde obtive um Associate's Degree e a partir do qual, terminado este percurso, a partir do BCC pude transferir-me para o Amherst College, onde me licenciei em Filosofia. Well, my family came to the uh, United States um, because I believe that I was the person. Uh, that, that constantly uh, brought to my parents' attention uh, that we needed to come to the United States. And uh, for my temperament, I think that was the best answer. Okay, being uh, uh, in uh, the islands, being in St. Michael Resorts, 
uh, being born in Yarifsh and the uh, so and the the vision that I had uh, was was quite difficult for me to stay there and what that was easy to do because my mother was born in the United States so being an American so that was easy for us to come so I, I definitely believe that I was the cause um, and uh, but thanks be to God my parents agreed with that so and uh, so uh, we came a minha ideia era sempre vir para a América, porque a América tinha um grande nome e uh, diziam que facilitava a vida de todos os imigrantes. E assim uh, viemos, viemos para cá e uh, afinal, para conseguir alguma coisa aqui também, teve que se trabalhar muito, muito trabalhei. Uh, Fiz, fiz trabalhos que, que nem esperava fazer, como uh, trabalhar em vidros, estive uh, num chapo de, de vidros, de construir uh, uh, janelas, uh, buildings, uh, fazer tudo. E uh, de qualquer maneira uh, foi bom porque aqui tinha bons detores e uh, tomamos conta da nossa, da nossa filha mais moça. The reason we came to America was that uh, in the um, late 1800s, my grandfather went back to Semgal. The reason being is that all the mills had closed down and then there was no jobs here and everybody was really suffering. So my grandfather took his family back and he left behind his two oldest sons who were over 18. And then he took my grandfather who was 15 years old. And so he went back to the islands with the girls and that's where we settled there. Unfortunately, when my grandfather got married in his late 20s, he wanted to come back to America because his brothers were here. My grandmother didn't want, did not want to leave the family, so we stayed behind. So we all stayed there for so many years. When President Kennedy became president, and I guess he lifted the, um, the ban of people coming back, my mother actually came to America with a U.S. passport. She was allowed to go apply for a U.S. passport, and the rest of us came uh, um, under her passport, but she actually came with a U.S. passport. I actually became a citizen in 1973 when I became a U.S. citizen. And uh, that my father was in Canada at that point in time. My father had gone, was one of those men that had gone to Canada in the late 50s to work in the railroad and uh, dairy farms. And then my father came to join us here. At that point in time, my mother was already 42 years old. And I look back and I think, how courageous that was because we picked up, we brought, we brought the clothes in our backs. We brought nothing. And we all came, and I was 10 years old at that point in time. And I think looking back, I wouldn't have done it because if I had, my mother had four kids, there was four of us, and to pack up everything and come to America. And no, no, we, we didn't speak the language, we, no, we had family here, but to make that change and bring all your kids with you, I think I wouldn't have done this, so I give him great courage for him to come over here and do this. When I came here, I went to the island of Santa Maria to catch the plane to come here. The, the Pan American no longer exists. This was in 1963. I had 75 cents in my pocket. I arrived on a Friday night. On Sunday morning, my cousins, which I, most of them I didn't even know they existed, were invited to come to my grandmother's house for a party to welcome me. That were the things that they did in the 60s. You welcome your cousins or your relatives that came from Portugal, and uh, they would give you a dollar, two dollars. In those days, was a lot of money. And an envelope, five dollars was already too much, but they gave you a few dollars. And I was very excited because that was my real first money. And on Monday morning, my aunt told me, he said, oh, first of all, thing you got to do is deposit, have your bank account. Never in my life I had a bank account. So I opened my bank account with $16. You know, that's the history of immigration. That's exactly what an immigrant does. In the years since the end of the Estado Novo, Portugal and the Azores have changed at a rapid rate. Innovation, technology, and the arts 
have flourished, transforming the once isolated islands into a vacation destination for the world. What effect did this have on the immigrants who returned to see the improvements and changes they once could only dream of? It's just fascinating to see how São Miguel, in a very short time, has become modernized, uh, but selectively so. In some cases, you see technological advances in São Miguel before they reach the United States. But yet there is this sense of history, there's a sense of environment and place um, that people want to sustain uh, on a small island in the middle of the Atlantic because they understand limits that Americans don't. The Luso Americans here, um, you know, their notion of Portugal and the islands was this 19th century snapshot that their grandparents shared with them that was totally out of whack with a new wave of immigrants that were coming in the 60s and 70s. And likewise, post-revolution, uh, and you know, you're being part of that whole generation of the revolution, um, you grew up with a free Portugal, no Salazar. Modern technology slowly coming in and being part of the, the backdrop, whereas for a lot of the elders, they go back to San Miguel and, boy, it wasn't like that when I left. My first trip to San Miguel was in 1976, and I didn't realize at that time that I was actually witnessing, witnessing the sort of demise of the old culture. Electricity was just coming in, indoor plumbing had just come in, and not everybody had it yet in 1976. So that there was still a lot of the old sort of early 20th century, 19th, 18th century style, look and feel about San Miguel. And I was able to shoot some of it, not even realizing what I was documenting at the time, you know. And so I, I treasure that, that opportunity to catch the threshold. You know, that's when I began. Uh, I go every year to Portugal, to the Azores, and one of the wonderful things that I see up there is the wonderful uh, attitude that people have. Oh, I haven't been here for 40 years. I haven't been here for 50 years. Oh, this has changed so much, you know. This has improved so much. I would love to be here more, uh, you know. That, uh, that's how things have changed dramatically, you know. And there are some traditions that are very strong here, and they don't want to exist in the Azores. Uh, you know, and people are shocked when they go back and they expect certain things to happen and it doesn't happen because it's no longer part of the culture up there. You know, the Azores is an autonomous region, has its own government uh, from Portugal, and it's uh, very much on their own, you know. So they have developed very, very fast. Also, the Azores has a very, very young population. And it's uh, next, next year, there's even younger population. Uh, so uh, it is very, very interesting because young people sometimes they're not interested what Vavuya uh, Vavo did, you know, so it's different. Uh, it's there, the tradition is there, the culture is there, but in a different way. I went back there actually 33 years after I was here. It was uh, kind of, you know, a long time before I went back. but. I enjoyed seeing things, beautiful developments in there that, you know, was nothing like that in the time that I was there. Well, it has been like uh, the way of living there, okay, is to be much different than what it is today. I, I see many, many changes. I uh, noticed people, uh, they haven't more things than what I did then, you know. They, they have all kinds of, you know, f the fridge, they have the humidifiers, they have the heating there already. You know, it's things like, in my days, there was nothing of that, nothing. Back in 1972, is very, you know, a little of it. And if there is uh, maybe rich people, I would put it that, that way, they did, they had it always, so they got the money, you got everything, you know, so. And that's how it goes. Oh, completely different. We were talking about this in the vinda para aqui. Os Açores no tempo que que me criei 
Era uma vida pobre, mas muito simples, e eram todos muito amigos, não havia... Uh, hoje em dia, os Açores é uma ilha turística, existe tudo o que se possa imaginar. Eles têm lá, ao passo que naquele tempo não, tudo era difícil, uh, mas com muita alegria, não havia... Uh, vivíamos uh, dia após dia, não havia televisão, não havia figuríficos, uh, eu lembro de não haver fogão a gás, eu lembro do primeiro que a minha mãe comprou, era um fogão pequenino, uh, da luz elétrica, não haver luz. Uh, eu lembro de ir para a casa da minha tia no Nordeste, uh, onde não havia absolutamente nada, era o chão terreiro, e uh, eles não tinham nem tão pouco um fogão. Uh, a petróleo, era tudo fogões a lenha, mas era uma alegria, quer dizer, tudo era unido. Hoje não, hoje lá eles, eles têm tudo, tudo e mais alguma coisa. Uh, só as diferenças são muito grandes. Hoje em dia eles nem tão pouco querem emigrar. Uh. Quando vamos uh, ao aeroporto uh, buscar um familiar imigrante uh, uh, que já não vem cá há duas ou três dezenas de anos, uh, a primeira expressão é abrir a boca de espanto. São as estradas, são os edifícios altos, são os carros, uh, continua a fazer uh, a confusão as ruas estreitas, isto não me deu, mas uh, depois é uma alegria imensa, eles uh, ainda reconheceram as casas onde brincavam, os passeios, as ruas continuam a existir, uh, os seus velhos amigos nas mesmas lojas, é outra outros aspectos que lhes dá um maior, uh, maior prazer e uh, claro que uh, tentam sempre revisitar aqueles sítios que se lembram, essencialmente as nossas furnas, as nossas sete cidades e uh, felizmente de ano para ano temos conseguido que uh, uh, na época do Senhor Santo Cristo, na época do, dos Espíritos Santos, uh, quando há um grande uh, movimento de imigrantes a vir para cá, de visita, o museu tem sido o local de, de paragem e, uh, e tem sido também muito gratificante para nós e para o nosso trabalho. So as things change in the Azores, many immigrants feel that they no longer have a place in their homeland and choose to continue to live with their children and families in the U.S., though many still long for the beauty of the island they remember. Yeah, para dizer a verdade. <coughs> Para ir para trás agora ah, vai ser muito difícil porque tinha que começar uma vida nova e ah, as bonitezas, as lindezas todas daquela ilha, está tudo, está, está tudo lá, está tudo ok, mas começar uma vida, ah, quase, quase pode se dizer assim, não tem lugar, não tem lugar para fazer uma vida ah, nova ali porque vai ser muito trambolhão e as coisas, as coisas a economia não está muito boa e é muito difícil agora para uma pessoa, para uma pessoa fazer uma, uma vida. Portanto, aqui não estou bem, 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 mas também não estou mal. E já que estou, fico, não, nunca, nunca deixando aquelas saudades de lá. Mas fazer uma vida nova agora lá, penso que não. The majority of them were not planning to stay here. They were going to come for five years and go back. They came to Menos um, Vida, as we used to say it. And then they were going to go back. But what didn't factor into it was that it cost money to live here. And they never actually made enough money to go back. And then their children became uh, Americanized, didn't want to go back. And then they had their own children, and so they got stuck here. And so they spent their whole lives having certain dodge of their homeland. And it was so diff so it was, they had to hold down to their culture and to the, the, the old ways. And my uncle and aunt who stayed behind, they evolved and my parents did. So we call, my cousins and I, we, we call them the frozen generation because they couldn't move forward. And yet they knew in their hearts that they, they could never go back to their homeland because it wasn't there anymore, what they knew as a culture. So it was kind of sad for them because my father just died recently. And it was kind of sad because he knew he could never go back. So he, they, he held on to his, um, his life. 
One large question remains about the story of Azorian immigrants, and that is, what about those who did not immigrate? What circumstances led them to stay in the Azores, and what is their perception of how the culture of the islands has changed? In 1970, de onde eu fui trabalhar com fome. E pronto, e o trabalho lá bastante puxado em relação ao serviço que eu fazia cá, que é praticamente no serviço que eu fazia, não fazia nada. Era o guarda do museu, fazia a segurança do museu, fazia a segurança dos alarmes. Portanto, era um, um serviço bastante leve em relação ao serviço que eu fui fazer para os Estados Unidos, que eu fui trabalhar com fome, coisa que eu nunca tinha feito está a raiva com máquinas, abrir covas para plantar da árvores, enfim. Pronto, foi um trabalho bastante duro. Pronto, não, não gostei. Não é só por, não, por o trabalho ser tão duro, mas por eles me pagarem por baixo da mesa, coisa que eu não sabia o que era, por pagar por baixo da mesa. E enquanto eles me pagavam, estava lá, não podia ser, não podia, tinha que ser assim. E uh, quando eles a mim pagavam 5 dólares a hora, eles pagavam, os americanos que lá trabalhavam, pagavam 10 e 12. Portanto, eu acho que eles estavam a explorar, porque visto que não estava lá afetivo, estava lá de passagem, e o patrão aproveitou-se de me pagar 5 dólares a hora e pagar mais aos que lá estavam afetivos. De maneira que o que, o que mais me irritou foi isto, porque, porque, porque fazia o mesmo trabalho do que eles e, não, pronto, e acho que era uma injustiça de pagar muito menos do que o Bossa pagar mais ou menos e pagar menos e menos. Pronto, o Bossa era açoriano, o Bossa era aqui do aqui da freguesia, de... Ai, como o nome daquela freguesia, a seguida da de... aprovação, o bolso era da aprovação, pronto, tinha um FAM, que é dos maiores que existem em Providência, que é dos maiores que existem em Providência, e até em Mãe Fall River, que a gente ia fazer ser... serviços para Fall River. Cortar ervas, plantar árvores, fazia-se de tudo, um FAM se faz de tudo. Tivemos... Seis filhos, meu pai e minha mãe tiveram seis filhos. Um, Manel, José, Denise, eu, uh, o Luís, que é o teu pai, uh, Fatinha e a uh, Maria José. Uh, Maria José e Fatinha foram para o Canadá, o Luís foi para a América e uh, o José, como se apareceu, esteve cá, estamos a fazer. E, uh, e eu então, eu, uh, por sorte, não, ou por azar, não sei, eu fiquei cá, porque eu também estava tão situacional de ir para o Canadá. Estava a trans... minha mãe ia fazer uma carta de chamada, e a uh, tal da sala foi, eu fui para a tropa, e, uh, e eu, uh, com... pronto, enquanto não, ia... enquanto não ia para o Canadá, eu arranjei emprego, e arranjei emprego na Quer dizer que eu gostei de estar na SAT, eu gostei de estar lá e, e pronto, eu conheci de mulher e a, e a mulher também, e, pronto, ficou na SAT e, e nós estávamos de onde de cá e resolvemos ficar por cá. Eu disse, ah, já, já passou, já os anos, já, já faz uns 30 anos, mas nós estamos com 71 anos, aqui de 72 anos. E pronto, eu também base, estou satisfeito aqui. Já fui visitar, visitar várias vezes a família lá fora, já, já, sim, são pessoas das afirmas, são tão Eu nunca tive aquela perspectiva de ir para fora também, uh, para ir tinha que ser por carta de chamada, e eu não tenho famílias próximas para me fazerem carta de chamada, por isso nunca, nunca fiz a ideia de lá ir. Uh, a minha família, a família do meu pai, geralmente está quase toda no Canadá, pronto, a família, uh, no Canadá. Migraram foi para o Canadá, para o Brasil, tem famílias no Brasil. 
E no Canadá. No Canadá só tem trem, mas agora, porque a minha madrinha e tudo já faleceu. For many Portuguese immigrants, the best path to assimilating into their new culture was through labor. For decades, Portuguese immigrants served as the backbone for the industrial and manufacturing industries in the Northeast. But as free trade and overseas competition came into being, many of the jobs which once had served as the basis of the immigrant economy began to first fade and then disappear, leaving a generation of immigrants, many of whom did not have advanced education, without an income to sustain the lifestyle they had become used to. They all came here and would go to factories because we had a lot of factories in Fall River, New Bedford, you know. It was a lot of them, okay, and that's where the jobs were. Now that they moved, they went ov offshore, you know, they overseas. So there's no jobs left in here. And I believe that a lot of this textile, including, you know, the apparel, both of them, they all moved out. I mean, there's nothing left, you know. The last one that closed up was the uh, Quaker fabric. That was about uh, 2,700 people working on that uh, factory, I mean, you know, in the textile. It's, it's a lot of... Where do they get the jobs? I mean, where are they going to go? I mean, their lives have changed totally. They, they have families with mortgages, with, uh, you know, to pay houses. And in some cases, they both worked in the same factory in Quaker Fabric. It was husband and wife's working in there. It was really, it was a shock for me. But I, I don't think that these jobs are ever going to come back, no. It's just a no-no. First of all, is the label is a lot more expensive here than then they get way they get them done in Honduras, Mexico, whatever, you know, China. So it's, um, it'll never come back here. No, I, I don't think so. It's just, it was very, very tough. And that, that's the reason why my factories closed up, all of them. And, you know, it's due to the fact of that, because, you know, everything gets made offshore, so. The manufacturing sector of the American economy nationally uh, has just been outsourced to the rest of the world. And so many of the people who came to, to work those industries find themselves as displaced workers. And it's intensive in this local triangle of Taunton, New Bedford, Fall River. And uh, the Portuguese are, you know, by far one of the groups most greatly impacted by that sort of economic displacement. And plus it, it really kind of hits at your pocketbook, you know? You no longer have the income, you no longer have the sort of security, um, and you still have all those bills to pay. Um, it puts you in quite serious social, psychological, fiscal distress. And there are programs that try to help some of the workers, and just like in the 1920s, well, we'll Americanize them, let's get them into English classes so we can improve their English skills so they can apply for Exactly what other jobs, but we'll see how the economy turns later. Right now, let's work on their, their language skills, their communication skills, which are vital for making a transition. As I reflect about my life and the lives of all the thousands of immigrants who left Portugal and the Azores, I return back to a word that began me on my journey, saudade. A word which resonates within the heart of all of us who at one time left the beauty and majesty of Portugal and the Azores. It is a calling we all have inside us and a longing we should not ignore. É, é, eu acho que se a gente definisse o que é saudades, elas acabavam-se. Com uma definição de saudades, eu penso que nós iríamos acabar com este conceito. Portanto, a saudade, e isso não é fugindo à pergunta, a saudade é alguma coisa que nós não conseguimos uh, definir uh, totalmente. Sentimos as saudades, mas eu penso que saudades, uh, uh, saudades ao fim e ao cabo, uh, uh, nós temos momentos de saudades, nós temos lugares onde a saudade existe, okay? nós temos tempos da saudade. E atenção que a saudade, embora muita gente, ou ao contrário do que se pareça, do que pareça as saudades até, até são uma coisa boa. A saudade para mim não é só o um, um choramingar, é muito mais do que isso. A saudade, no fundo, no fundo, é um conceito que nós temos, não é? E é um 
como você disse muito bem aí em inglês, é de facto um feeling, é um nome, é um substantivo, um, e que significa muitas coisas e muitas delas no lado positivo. É bom ter saudades do país de onde nós viemos. É ótimo ter saudades dos nossos amigos. É fantástico nós termos saudades dos nossos pais. Okay? É, é extremamente importante que nós continuemos a ter saudades do tempo em que nos criamos. Okay?